Okay, so um, hi everybody. Thanks for showing up at this. Um, I think I put down this as like a intermediate. So I hope everybody isn't thinking this is some like life shattering thing about lower rear seat to floor height. But um, my name is Stephanie Tangway. I'm a clinical education specialist for motion concepts. Been with them for about 17 years. Long, long ago before that, I was an ATP provider for about seven. And before that, I worked as an OT for 13 years at the Rehab Institute of Michigan in Detroit. My co-host. I'm Patrice Kennedy. Uh, I've been at the Denver VA for 27 years. My running joke is I started when I was two. So <laughs> I've been there my whole career, so. Yep. And um, I, what we are doing here basically is I totally conned Patrice. Horn swoggled into, me completely. Yeah, totally. Over a drink. Yeah, I totally horn swoggled her, great new word, uh, into um, doing this presentation with me. I've been wanting to do a presentation about uh, the adjustment of lower rear seat to floor height in manual chairs for a long time. Um, I'll explain very quickly why that is, but in my current position, my role uh, as a clinical educator, I travel all over the United States. I go into seating clinics and facilities. I meet the consumers who use wheeled mobility. Um, and it is a little distressing to me that over the course of the, of the 17 years I've been doing this, I've noticed um, in a lot of places that there are a lot of consumers who are using equipment that has a, a very minimal lower rear seat to floor height compared to front seat to floor height. Um, and it's, um, I, I don't know that, I think that part of it, as I'll explain, I think part of it's like, short length of stays and compression of the amount of time you have and everything else would we'll touch on that. But I really, I, I don't think that, I think we're missing the boat a little bit. And I think our consumers are missing the boat a little bit on this. Um, so our objectives for today, um, that in the next 55 minutes after this, if you can't already do this, you should all be able to uh, uh, describe the mechanical effect of lowering the rear seat to floor height of both a rigid and a cross frame uh, manual chair. You should all be able to list at least three functional impacts of a rear seat to floor height that is an inch and a half or lower than the front seat to floor height for the consumer. And you should be able to describe the ways, um, some ways to address two or more postural orientation issues which may result from lowering rear seat to floor height. So not super hard stuff to do. Uh, at all so and and this is I was going to call this slide literally like what are we doing here, but the need for adjustment versus the actual adjusting of a chair is really what. Um, what this is going to focus on because we we all for the clinicians in the room, we are all using the need for adjustability in our justification letters to secure funding for a, for K five and above chairs um, and then we're not always adjusting them. Um, I meet a lot of people who have never played around with their own chair, never changed their own chair. They use the chair configured the same way it was when they got their first manual chair, their second manual chair replicated exactly what their first manual chair was. So we're never getting a chance to try anything. So it's this need for adjustability um, that that I, I just don't think we're take we're getting an opportunity to take advantage of it. And a lot of the chairs that I see that are provided by manufacturers rep samples. Uh, sample chairs that are in facilities, those are not set up with a lot of aggressive lower rear seat to floor height variants from front. So we don't have things that are even set up to, hey, try something that's only an inch and a half and here this one's two or this one's two and a half and try some different things. Uh, we're just kind of like, just we just don't really address it. Um, so I think there's also a perception with some clinicians that, um, and maybe consumers also, that they kind of get this from us, uh, that they think that the lower the rear seat to floor height is, it's going to make their transfers, everything's going to be harder, it's going to be, you're going to really struggle. And so we end up keeping them in a little bit higher rear seat to floor height orientation uh, in, in their seating, a little bit farther away from interfacing to the push room of their chair, uh, because it makes the transfers easier. And, you know, and I also get it, like the luxury of time I was just discussing with a very dear friend of mine who runs a sitting clinic at the facility where I used to work. Um, and um, because she's working in an outpatient clinic, um, she's kind of frustrated because the inpatient therapists are not ever doing lower rear seat to floor heights. 
she gets to see somebody for their second or third chair and they're they've had five six years using it configured that way and they're like no 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 it has to be just like this they can't imagine five years of using something anything you change might be like a mind-blowing you're gonna you're gonna blow up my world you can't do that so it's like we kind of can miss the opportunity to to do that um and then so the person who's really missing out is really the consumer and i i loved having this opportunity to do this with Patrice because she has access to gobs of consumers. And as you're going to see in the case studies that she's going to be sharing with us today, um, she's got she's got people that are tr are playing around with their own chairs and trying some really different stuff and up and game for trying things and still making adjustments, even if they've been using wheel mobility for yeah. years, still trying to tweak it and dial it in and fine tune it. So um, so I do not mean this to be offensive, but this is what I think we're missing. This is my friend Anita. I worked with Anita years and years and years ago, young woman with a uh, complete C6 spinal cord injury. Um, and if you notice the amount of, um, if you guys can see the amount of uh, rear seat to floor height that she has, that's her first chair. Most people would not set up a chair that aggressively variant lower in the rear on somebody's first chair. Um, this was back in an age, and I know I'm a dinosaur, but this is back in the day when we used to keep a lot of our quadriplegics in patient rehab for 12, 14 weeks. So people really worked and practiced on all kinds of transfers, transferring off the floor, floor to bed, like people, we had the luxury of the time to really work on a lot of things and really play around with chairs. So what, what this brings to the table for Anita is this low center of mass incredible stability um, as we'll talk about during the presentation uh, during the rest of the presentation you'll notice that as we are lowering our rear seat to floor height we're essentially tilting somebody in space a little bit and then on these rigid chairs that still have, have angle adjustment for the back we can fine-tune that she's kind of wedged in there a little bit so gobs of stability but it really keeps her psis stable in her pelvis she sits very upright super functional but this is what we would sometimes, and I, I do not mean to offend anybody with this. So as I said, I'm an old dog. We used to refer to these consumers as our super quads, right? These are, these are not consumers who are like, I need a power chair. I got it, you know, it's like, she's not worried about saving her shoulders early on. She wants to be as functional, lightweight. She wants her friends to be able to come over the house, pick her up and go out with, you know, go out dancing and stuff. So she doesn't want something that's heavy and cumbersome. And she wants to maximize her abilities to be functional and independent in a chair like this and have a lot of options. So anyway, I just think that I just think that by, by that we're missing it if we're not giving people the opportunity to try to look at this. So really quick, if you've not done this and I get it, I, I didn't have any brothers. I had to be the guy, the, the person handing my dad the tools when he was fixing his car. So I like wrenching on chairs. I figured that out early. But when you have to take things apart and move it, if you have to do this yourself, even, you know, you don't have to have a gob of mechanical aptitude, especially it's nice now because you can take a picture of it so you can try to put it back together the way you found it. <laughs> Always helpful. <laughs> um, but a lot of our chairs still have adjustable rear axles. It might be the old, more the old fashioned kind where uh, that you would see like that is an old, 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 like first version of the Quickie 2 up there in the top left hand corner. Um, so that's an antique right there. You're going to pull full bo four bolts out, and this is this whole thing would move on an index. So you've got a bunch of holes on both sides. I pull those four bolts out and move the whole thing up and down in the frame. If I move that axle plate higher, right, I'm lowering my rear seat to floor height. And if I move that down on the frame, I'm raising my rear seat to floor height. And in back in those old days, they were very linear plates like that. We have, it's more common now for chairs that still use this to maybe have these more U-shaped or offset plates that give you the ability to even invert them so I can get a little bit higher or a little bit lower, depending. Lots of versatility with that. So that's, that's, that's the nuance for that. And most of the chairs, rigid or, or uh, folding frame, if you are going to change your rear seat to floor height, you also have to do some other stuff like true your casters because as i tilt my chair in space my my caster is no longer going to be even parallel to the ground the caster housing is going to be angled 
um, it's going to provide more rolling resistance. So that that is part of it, the mechanics of that. So we, there are still some some chairs on the market that use these more um, eccentric bolts that you see, those little inserts, the insert, um, the flat insert that's a weird shape, squirrely shape. So you're just backing out the nut enough to be able to rotate those and drop them back in the slotting so that it would hold it. You have to reverse the mirror opposite on the opposite caster to do that. Um, but we see more and more of our rigid chairs that are using, uh, whether you're adjusting from the top, from the underneath, it's a little, sometimes it's a little interesting, new chairs, but we're getting new chairs all the time from all over the world now, so it's really cool. But you see a lot of chairs that use more of these round compression type fittings, where if I loosen that compression, I can rotate that caster through that, true it up so it's going to be parallel, the fork would be parallel even to the floor, and then be able to tighten that up. So that's the mechanics of it, but that takes some time and you have to check a lot of things when you do it. So um, using a level, using a caster square, um, where's Maz? Oh yeah. I got Maz's, Maz. where's Maz's cool? Maz gave us so, the app. Yep, so oh, the, yeah, so Maz gave us a great app. He Maz was helping us do it. Gave us the some clinometer clients. app. Yeah, so you so can you put so, this on that. So I can, whoop, 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 whoop. So there's a that's Maz's kilometer. Yeah, so it's like cool. if you're, it's like I can't great. read a goniometer anymore. New. So it's like I love the, the the kilometer made that really easy. So there's some great technology and cool things that you can do to help make this process easier. But basically, I need to have my caster housing. I'm looking for that depending on the angle of the chair. I want my caster housing to be perpendicular to the floor, typically, so that the chair will if you push it that you don't get the run back. If you've ever pushed a chair that did not have a true caster, um, you would push forward. And then when you stop pushing, especially if you're on like linoleum or hardwood, all of a sudden your chair kind of drifts back and your casters, the forks spin and you're kind of back up a little bit. That would probably be, be a great indicator if that happens to a chair you're in or a consumer that you're working with, that the, ch the chair, um, the, the casters have not been true. So to, to be truly adjusted. So you wanna be able to do that. And we'll get back to this picture, but this is actually the luxury that my friend Patrice has here, which is a shop with some technicians to help out. Every therapist's dream in a facility, here, make this, do this, change this, and true up the casters so we can get her clients right back and in I have a good rep. Yeah. See, and her manufacturing. My rep, rep, Maz is my rep. All right, so rep, let yes. me let you so, tell them about um, where you work. This picture, can you hear me? Lovely. This picture is the new VA. Um, I will quietly say it's a billion dollars over budget and took 12, 12 extra years to bake. But, <laughs> but my federal tax great, dollars yeah. work. It's, so it's, anyway, <laughs> but it's, good deal. It's a beautiful facility now. Um, how long, um, Jody, has the spinal cord unit been open? Three years. So uh, when we opened this new hospital, we opened a 30 bed spinal cord unit. Um, I before that was doing the wheelchair program for everybody. Once we opened it, the spinal cord unit has their own wheelchair team and I am part of rehab PM&R and um, I do all the others. So stroke, APT, parks, every, everything but SCID, which is um, uh, spinal cord, MS and ALS. But we have two teams and we have one wheelchair shop and we have three technicians, in, three technicians in that wheelchair shop. We have one that's an ATP and an SMS. Uh, he's fantastic. And then we have two other techs. So um, we both filter into that wheelchair shop. So that allows us to have quality control for our repairs. Uh, often the VA will pay to send repairs out, people out to the, to the community, to their house, or to come into our place. Typically, they'd rather come into their, our place if they have the ability to transport because uh, they know what they're getting. So I've tried to pluck the best people out in the community and put them in into our facility. Yeah. All right, so when I pitched the idea of doing this presentation, you have to appreciate the fact that I work for a manufacturer and essentially I work for a company that doesn't make manual wheelchairs. So <laughs> you know, I have zero conflict of interest. In my, in my little head, I have zero conflict of interest on this, but I do work for a manufacturer. So Patrice has got gobs of consumers uh, access that she works with and very, very closely and lots of seating experience. I had a lot of seating experience. I got no consumers to work with. <laughs> so it's like the best of both worlds. But the other thing that I have to say is every time I get to visit the VA, um, even when you guys are at the old place, 
Um, it's always impressed me like how many of the people and the staff that I get to see like are you know at different levels but very into seating and they have this great like to have a shop like I get that that's like the that's like the ah it's amazing it'd be wonderful um but they also have the luxury of time to be able to bring in a veteran even look at somebody after they've received a chair to be able to do a follow-up and to make tweaking adjustments and I think that's one of the things that we really um, we really lack in a lot of other settings and most other settings realistically um, that who, we can't bill for it. Um, you know, the, the clinician can't bill for the adjustments. The provider can't really bill for the adjustments. Um, sometimes you might be able to get them to give you a tech to do something like that. You might be tapping into your manufacturer's reps to help you out. Um, therapists in the room, uh, hey, can you lower that, do this, blah, blah, blah. But a lot of times we just don't do this. So, um, so Patrice, and I'm just gonna tell you how amazing this was. She contacted what 11, 10, 11 people, 10 people. and um, and and I go over like an afternoon and two full days, and they all showed up, which is amazing. You guys should be like ooh ah, uh, all of them showed up on time with their stuff. It was awesome, right? So um, so it's great. I got my little geeky tweaking on chairs thing on, which was great because I don't get a chance to play around with a lot of manual chairs anymore. Um, so we're going to share a couple of different case studies. Um, and the one thing about what Patrice just said that I really want to stick out to you, I know that typically in your head, you probably always think about this as being an, like more of like a, a consumer with an SCI issue, right? Seat, row seat to floor. Rear seat to floor head adjustment benefits everybody who's using wheeled mobility for their primary mobility. So our first case uh, is a, a, a consumer that uh, or veteran that I should say I always say consumer but these are all going to be veterans that um, that Patrice has worked with who came in and um, we only are sharing case studies where we had adjustable frames for the most part mm -hmm. um, in this presentation because we really wanted to look where everybody was and then make some like what do you think do you want to try something a little bit different and and see what would happen and and record this and be able to discuss this so um, do you want to go? Do you want me to go? Yeah, so keep going. Um, so uh, so this I'll jump woman, in when you. Yep. So this one. I got my tape. This okay. Yeah, right. you got to shut me up. So this one is in a, a obviously a rigid ZRA. Uh, so it's a tie light chair, front seat to floor height. When we saw when she came in, eighteen inches, rear seat to floor height of sixteen. So a two inch variance, which is a pretty functional basic variance. Um, nice place to start. She's been using this chair for already over seven years, seven to eight, right in that window. Um, but the other thing that was really striking, I mean, it's a pretty wide frame for her, and she's lost 60 pounds, which is pretty significant for somebody that's, um, that really doesn't spend a lot of time ambulating, even though she has a prosthesis and she has crutches, right? Yeah, this is a, um, a female patient that I think, um, especially in the VA, um, a lot of our, sometimes our female patients, depending on um, their service, she doesn't complain. She doesn't. She didn't. She didn't tell me anything was wrong. I actually didn't do this chair. This was somebody else, uh, one of my other colleagues. But you know, her, her life changed, and she just thought she would just live with it. And um, I said, "Why didn't you call me?" She goes, "Well, it's still working." But I think it, that's where it goes to show where the recheck is so important because um, sometimes you just don't know. Some people that will call you every day, five times a day, right? And, and you'll know right, as soon as they go home. <laughs> And then you have the other patients that just don't complain. Right. And she goes, well, I have wheels, but I said, look, we can make this so much better. Yeah. And um, I, yeah, I think that's the point is, uh, this is not here to say, we, we just want to encourage you to do one or, one or two more things each time. And if you're making small differences, you're still making big differences in people's lives. Yeah. So the one thing you, you might notice, so there's a couple of things I dropped in, and I'm just gonna step away from the mic here. So, um, so first off, you can see the little X's that I've got on her shoulders. So when you look at an, an, an anterior view of somebody, and and you know I will say this, I'm not I'm not being discriminatory. Even pre-COVID, I got a wider butt than I do torso. I needed a wider butt. Oh, you think so? I need that really? Really? You don't. Just in case. Okay. So <laughs> just in case. So um, anyway, so um, we, the big. One big noticeable difference with this is if you look where the shoulder is, where women tend to be more petite or, or narrower at the shoulder and possibly wider at the hips, she's really got to reach outboard a lot um, to get to her hand rims. So 
Um, she's also, even though she's got a two inch lower rear seat to floor height, um, she has very, very small amount of access. So you can see where I colored in in red uh, on the picture on the far right. Um, she, without deviating her trunk, leaning forward, she's got uh, not does not have a lot of access to the rear to the propulsion wheel uh, or the propulsion rim. So um, we can certainly make that more efficient, I think, for her uh, by lowering her down a little bit. She also is a lower extremity amputee, so it's not like this. This should not be something that's going to compromise her or complicate her transfers, right? Right. Right. So. Um, and so what we ended up doing, you want to go through this? I can come. No, no, I'll, I'll jump in. I'm going to read off the in. screen. You do. Yeah. <laughs> so, so this is our before, our, these are the change with the changes here. So, so yeah, we changed her uh, seat to floor height. Uh, we went down to 14.8. Um, and we'll talk about, in a, in a couple more slides, we'll talk about um, being consistently inconsistent in how you measure. You know, it's important to be consistent when you measure. Everybody measures slightly different. Um, and we closed her seat to back angle. Uh, we lowered her push gains. This was a huge problem. And um, that's not why we brought her in, but it, it became very obvious when she was in that the push canes are often set up for caregivers and not for the client themselves. So the, the push canes were attacking her back. Um, so we lowered those 1.5 inches. And so that in the end result allowed her to sit up more upright and, and obviously more comfortable and easier to propel. She really, really talked about her propulsion afterwards. So, so when you look at like those side views of her, if you look where the tip of her finger is in relation to the axle, can everybody see that? So ideally, if, if somebody has the ability to extend their fingers when their shoulders straight down, really look, kind of looking at that relationship, a, a great place to start with an assessment would be if that was pretty much right in line with her shoulder and that the tip of your middle finger would be fairly close, if not on, the axle of the propulsion wheel. So that was probably going to give you enough lower rear seat to floor to access, comfortably access, if you have full range of motion, uh, most of the hand room for her propulsion. So she's up a little bit higher there, but when we, we start lowering, so it was not, not quite an inch and a half there, but um, she, we bring her a little bit closer. And again, keep in mind, we're lowering the rear seat to floor height, we have to make some other adjustments, but we have to close the back angle up because it's like we've tilted her in space if all we do is drop the rear uh, seat to floor. Does that, does that make sense to everybody? Okay. So, um, so that's kind of like a nice comparison of the changes. So the first picture that you see near me on the left, um, that was the start. So I put a little yellow dot over the center axle, and then we lowered the rear seat to floor height here. But the other thing is, when, when Patrice was talking about with the back, this is, this is how that was set up. So where the push handles are up so high, if you can imagine every time you push, Every time you bring your, your arm swings back to grab your push rim, that you're running into the back cane, like right in your tricep area. So it's going to limit your range of motion. You know, I, I, ideally, I would say I would love to see a manual chair manufacturer, whoever's in the room. I would love to see somebody come up with a decent end, uh, endomorph back cane option for manual chairs, where the back canes come up and jog in an inch a little bit, because all of, all of the pairs in the world even a little pair like me would really benefit from bringing those, kicking those back canes in a little bit closer, especially for consumers like this who are, she's not using an armrest, so I don't have to worry about the interference of that, or I can go to a team armor if I really needed it. But when we, all we do is lower the cane and get that a little bit more out of her way, that, which is all we could do to change it on this particular chair. And then, of course, Patrice is like, I need to get you a new chair. Yeah. yeah, I begged her to come in on a Saturday, and then, you know, she actually tickled pink. She ended up getting uh, carbon fiber lobster and crutches and a new chair out of this. Yeah. So that, that was great. My, for the amputees, for your amputees, the people that live in, work in the VA, the uh, side sticks, I'm going to put a plug in for side sticks, carbon fiber lobster ends are a great solution. And um, it really, it really saves the shoulders. Really nice, much better than regular lobster ends. Much lighter. All right, so any um, questions? Not, none of this is rocket science, but it's That's just true. a matter of, you know, just paying attention and making an adjustment or two when you see them. Yep, Faith? Just a quick comment. Sure. The endomorph concept is a great idea, right. except when you're putting a firm back on, you're already using the width, and so you end up getting someone that has a wide 
I just mean it as an option, right? An option. This is an yeah. option. The, the, well, the first, the first time, the only time I ever did females. that on a manual chair was for a young kid with, uh, with elephantiasis. And I needed a 20 inch wide chair because of the circumference of his thighs, but he was like 14 wide at the torso. He was like 15 years old. And I had a great engineer that worked as, um, for a company and he made stainless steel endomorph back canes for me for uh, old Invacare MVP. So it worked for me, man, <laughs> solved my problems. So anyway, so for back frame adjustment, right? So just keep, keep these things in mind, right? The changes in the rear seat to floor height can require adjustments to the back frame angle and the caster angle. Um, and that most, most rigid chairs, unless you're getting into something very custom, super dialed in, uh, where you're taking every measurement of the consumer and it's being built for them. So can I put in a plug for our buddies? Sure. All right, so uh, not our buddies, but I just, if we had a chance to look at the RGK chairs. So, um, you know, like the old, like, or like, you know, we used to, I used to do like top end chairs like that. There's some great sports chairs that you order and you take every measurement of the consumer and they build a chair. That's not what this is. This is when you, when we are at your set, your first, second, third chair where you might have uh, gone from cross brace to rigid and you still have a, the mechanism to make some back angle adjustments. I would not go to like a built welded together just for you chair until I knew that I had done all of this work and really dialed it in for somebody. And it was like, it was like, Wicked awesome, as they would it, it, say out that, in the Northwest. With that being said, it's even hard to do a totally built for you, welded everything if somebody doesn't know where their body is in space. There are just some people that can't tell you uh, why they're rolling better. And, and some people can tell you they're princess in the pea. You've changed this and I can feel it here, here, here. So if you have somebody that is general and, and just you know, cognitively can't tell you it. That's really tricky. I end up doing still adjustability for them, even as the years go on, because um, I you can get really locked into that rigid and get and get stuck with an eight thousand dollar chair that might not work. Um, and so the other thing, if you've, um, I'm sure there's probably some people in here that do this all the time. If you've never adjusted back frame angle, and I picked one of the weirdest ones that I have access to to show you, just as an example, but. It's really important that you figure out how to do this. Sometimes this would be included in the owner's manual of the chair. Uh, all of those are available on the manufacturer's website. So if somebody even shows up in an old chair, you can probably pull that up if you want to do it. Do not start on this project unless you have some time, OK? Because if you get it half disassembled and time runs out, you're everybody's going to be hurting bad. So um, anyway, so I, this is another thing that you might be taking pictures of. So you can either put it back the way it was or figure out what you did. Rights and lefts will be mirrored opposites typically in how you do this. This is probably one of the weirdest ones. This is on, an, uh, on a Kushal chair that I have at home. And it's like, it's like I have to really like tweak, think about it when I'm doing, when I'm working on that one. So anyway, so Oh, Derek. This is, this is a great. Derek came in. Yeah. He was great. He's uh, six five, and he's an amputee. He walked in with his leg on with three chairs. He walked in with three all the chairs he had in his life, and it, it was, he's like, "All right, I brought them all," and it was great. So the so the second chair, which was the the oldest one, he had three, but he didn't bring the the very first one. The second chair was a quickie two that I think he got at Balboa when he first got injured. And then the and that's what he's in here. Yeah, and then the last, and we'll go over the next two. The next two were chairs that he got uh, from us. Um, I would say that every chair he's upgraded. Every yeah, time. He, like, keeps he's upgrading. he keeps upgrading. He keeps upgrading. So, which is really what time? Thirty minutes. Thirty minutes. Okay, yep. So, um, anyway, thank you. Yep. Yeah. So needed that. <laughs> anyway. So um, yeah. So this, and he's a tall guy, right? So. You know, even with this chair, um, I probably, you know, there's like little nuancey things. It's got a little bit of lower rear seat to floor height, back upholstery. So it's it's not a real elaborate thing. And I know, I, I get it. You Some people are going to be like, why do you need to look at these rigid frame or super lightweight manual chairs for somebody with a large frame amputee? So it's like, yeah, a lot of times he's, he's ambulating with his prosthesis. But when he needs to have a revision, when he needs to have or an adjustment to the he's prosthesis, he's got a wound. He's got a you know? wound. Yep. And then he's like in the chair for maybe weeks, months. weeks, weeks, he could or be months, in the chair for right? Months. 
So then the kind of chair you have is it's a big really deal. big darn deal, right? Mm -hmm. So um, anyway, so he, he went to, um, uh, this is an aluminum uh, tie this chair, a, I believe. Yeah, right? TR, tie light TR, yeah. Um, yep, and then so I had to go down with the back. I mean, at first, the, the quickie two got in Balboa, which just kind of thrown at him. And then, you know, so just have a chair because he needed it. And then, so he had all this, uh, he's a tall, tall trunk. He's a tall guy everywhere. And so I really had to get him away from the idea of him needing so much back support. So we've been gradually over the chair shrinking his back. I mean, he's got full trunk, no issues with that. But he was used to just having a high back. And I said, I don't think you need that high of a back. So, you know, that was part of this process and offering a rigid frame as opposed to a um, folding frame. I prefer, I prefer rigid frames with my, everybody, with my amputees, but a lot of amputees that they have a good leg to stand on don't want to do rigid. They want to fold and pop it in the chair and pop it in the trunk that you or the back of the seat. Um, you know, it's really, um, it's different now. Um, it's different for everybody. My bilateral above knee amputees, of course, that don't use their, their legs or sea legs very often they're, they always want rigid, but there's a lot of other people that just want folding. So, um, so house. on this, so that's, we've, she's gone from, uh, with this chair, we went from that taller upholstery to a, that's a 16 inch length aluminum that back from ADI yeah. on that one. And then at the time when I got to meet him, this was his most recent chair. This is the apex from motion composites. And this was his fairly recent new chair. And then we were able to do a 12 inch back and now I really want to go to a nine inch back. <laughs> So I just ordered him a nine inch after this, after this research we did with him. Yeah. Right. And I would actually say that was one of the things as a, as, and I, I don't not mean this as a criticism, criticism. No. and you know, Patrice and I know each other, we had never really, you know, worked seen, together. Yeah, worked together. And um, so it was, it was actually great. What I really enjoyed about this extra, whole exercise that we went through is like being able to like, what do you think about this? What do you think about this? But it also, I'm, I really love short backs. And these last, these two consumers are amputees. Like there's no reason to have a back all the way up to the inferior scapula unless you've got really horrible balance or a lot of back pain or something I can't even imagine. So even the difference of going to the 12 and here's all three of those backs. Um, so, and I just dropped in a yellow line so you can kind of see about where um, the upholstery is, um, is and, hitting them. And but, we prefer uh, and, to take the, the back, backs. you know, have that space at the, you know, underneath your PSIS, have some space there. I prefer not to have the back sitting on top of the cushion. Yeah, so you end up with, you know, upholstery that closes that off. Uh, even on this, it's the lower part of the back, the 16 inch length back was just about touching the top of the seat cushion. The 12 inch carbon, there is actually, I know it's a really dark picture, but at least I can see his jeans underneath there. But if, if you go to a nine, like it, that's gonna really let you guys like, stabilize his PSAS and stay well below his inferior scapula. Just really <laughs> dial it in. He's got full muscular chair in his upper body. So it's actually sometimes the, the, the seated posture actually is better because you're not coming up so high, you're not cacking somebody forward. Oh, and he's got the range of motion. He's got yeah. that lumbar curve. Yep. So any questions about, does that look pretty, pretty, pretty good? So I want you to talk about oh. this. <laughs> yeah, so, so. This was a little bit different for me. This is something I've never done before, but there's yeah. some great research about this. I, yeah, I measure uh, elbow flexion. And you know, the research supports 100 to 120 degrees is optimal um, from various research that I read. Now, of course, this has so many variables though. It has to do with trunk stability, um, you know, your seat slope. And then the torque forces in the hand rims, it has to do with whether you are pushing with a shoulder injury, are you compensating, or do you, are you pushing as a viable, healthy shoulder girdle? I mean, all these things play a factor. And what I always say is this is a baseline. This is where you start, and then you have to deviate. Uh, depending on a person's uh, functional movement and their their weak their strength and their um, yeah and their posture. So I've I've got at the last next to last slide I've got a bunch of references and I'll, we're happy to send those out to you. But there's uh, some really interesting stuff that looked at this specifically research that was done at the VA, at AVA. Yeah, at AVA. Mm -hmm. so. It was uh, R R and D VA yeah. research. Mm -hmm. So. Um, <laughs> So really, really quick. So I, so that's two case studies. So, so as I just said, I really like short backs. Um, and, you know, 
you know, this is, I, I, you know, I get it. There are a lot of people, they take a measurement to the top of the shoulder and then it's like they, they base all of their back height selection or back length selection based on that. Um, but, you know, like primary diagnosis, what they're going to be doing, if I, we're not showing you anybody who's going to be in a power chair and a manual tilt, like that's a different animal. When you've got people with, you know, fairly full range of motion, even, even our most challenging person here, um, you know, where the back actually has to support them, it's really about the, the amount of contact, surface contact posterior. You don't want so low that somebody falls over the top of the back, but if they've got intact core musculature, their deep back muscles are all, um, you know, all intact. I, I usually am going to start off between stabilizing the PSAS and then I, it's all about how high I'm coming up on the spine for me. And if I can keep something been between the PSIS and the inferior scapula, for, uh, and and then it's like, how low can you go for me? Um, so, <laughs> um, anyway, so anything you want to say about that? No, nope, that's okay. good. I'm like watching my watch here, so it's going to be a miracle if we're done on time for me. So, anyway, so here's a little bit different type of a client, not an amputee. No, nope, this is Dan. Um... He was really excited to be in the study. He said, oh, I'm going to be up on a screen, I suggest, in your fancy green chair. So um, it, this fella has a bunch of or orthopedic injuries and, um, and some significant PTSD. So his front seat to floor height was about 18.75, and his rear was started at 17.5. And, yeah. and the, the next slide goes when I was saying be, yeah. measure consistently. So when we all got together, we have Maz over here, and then we have uh, um, Staff of myself. Yeah, reps. I had all kinds of people. And use your manufacturer's reps. You, you know, they're they. You are their customer. Bring, get them in. I always say, get them in. But I, I always think it's important to you're consistently inconsistent or you're accurately inaccurate. Meaning, figure out how you measure. I always measure from the top of the tube. Some and then somebody might measure from the top of the rail where the seat sling is. But be consistent about how you do that. And if you're working with two people, make sure you're measuring the same way. Now, with that being said, I also pulled up every quote because I save all my quotes. All my quotes are electronically saved. So I we measured them without me pulling up the quotes first. And then I, I matched with what I ordered on the quote. And sometimes they were a half yeah. an inch off or a quarter. So on this one, so. you measured, I measured, and Maz measured, and we all measured different. Slightly ones. different, yeah. And it was so. all different than what was on your notes. <laughs> oh, my, my quote. Chair was yeah. So it's it's just a point of yeah. now my Whoever's scribing and measuring that person's got to do it all both yeah, the same gonna, same person has right? to do it and yeah. then your shop my shop always if my it comes through for me they know how i measure so they build it to the way i measure they'll build it slightly different to the way david measures or maybe the way jody measures but you know yeah as long as you're consistent with your own but anyway yeah. it's pretty funny so and then this was uh we were making a seat a rear seat to floor height change for this for this gentleman and of, after we did we made the change for the rear but she's like let's just go into the shop and i was like oh and now, now i am like a kid in a candy shop where there's a shop there's somebody that's here to do this it was amazing so um yeah so truing the casters again so and and even even the guys in your shop they've all got a different way of doing okay. this but um and 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 granted depending on the type of chair you're using and how the how your front caster fork assembly is attached to your frame, um, it's not always as easy as just grabbing a you know a right angle square off the rack and doing this. But um, but it was like boom boom on the table off the table, and we were we had him back in the chair to try this out. So um, and we, so he, go on. I was saying we do realize how fortunate we are, and and the idea here is not to say we have all this. The idea is to say. Get the help you need in if you can, if you're manufacturers. And even if you're making one change, it's a big change for somebody. So all we did here was lower the rear seat to floor height a half of an inch. Mm -hmm. And we did raise the back support. So if I go, I know this always makes me kind of bark, but if you kind of look at this, when I look at this, like he was trying to sit very straight, um, but he's a little bit more, he's a little bit like he's, Looks like he's working too hard. I don't know how else to really put this, but when we did this, like he, his shoulders kind of came back a little bit as the back came up. So you should, you know, this, this I kind of thought was really, he benefited from having a little bit lower center of gravity with this lower rear seat to floor height, but the 
when we got the backup for him, it's like it was like he could really like he felt confident in being able to he could sit up and be in contact and not have to work to sit up. Right. Imagine how fatiguing that is. We supported his spine where it needed to be yeah. supported is what yeah. we did. Yeah. So. Mm -hmm. um, so and. Oh. Yeah, yeah. So he says after, you know, after he's pushing around a little bit, we liked his uh, saying, I get more umph yeah, for push. I get more umph for it's push. easier to do wheelies. Right? Yeah. So, and you're measuring, I know we have another. You know, oh, measure, yeah. So measuring at a caster height, this is also something that I never did. As I, I mean, I kind of do this as clinically, a, yes, and I haven't, you I know, I want to do this. I haven't done any research on it yet, but uh, I usually find that once I get the chair, uh, dialed in where I want it and they're ha and it's the optimal propulsion for them at that level where they are today, whether they're just learning skills and they're going to come back to me. Um, it's usually about three to five inches from floor to caster height. Um, so I've just been, you know, I keep measuring that and keep looking at that and it's in my own brain. So I haven't done more with that yet, but. And I will just, let me just say. Oh, I'm, I'm just taking that information. Um, I, I'm always curious when I get the chair where they're comfortable and they feel like it's optimal with the center of gravity, the rear seat to floor height, then I just take a, a floor to caster height measurement. And so what I I've mean, found, it's usually around three when, to five. When they're in a wheeling. So, when they're in so a wheeling. So imagine what that is. So I, I get it. The, the optimal goal, of course, is that you can roll and pop a wheelie in Not forward motion and, and have enough clearance to get on top of a curb. If you can only hold a wheelie at an inch and a half, mm -hmm. you got to know you're not going to make it up the two and a half inch curb out in front of the bank, right? So and if you have to do a wheelie and it, and you're comfortable in that, that wheelie is stabilized in seven inches, you're working hard to get up there, right? So I don't want them to work that hard to get up there. Right. So, so and then just this should. So I just shot this really, this isn't the greatest quality video off my phone, but so he's actually propelling um, the dynamic wheeling. Dynamic wheeling. So mm -hmm. wheeling, uh, wheeling uh, in the gym, holding that up a little bit, which I thought was pretty, pretty cool. Um, the thing we had to do in order to raise the back, um, if you're using aftermarket backs, and I don't really care whose aftermarket back you're using, most aftermarket, every aftermarket back just about you're going to see in the show floor this week, um, you've got hardware that you can move up and down in relation to your back cane if you've got real estate. Of course, we always have to deal with like welded on rigid, rigidizers or, um, you know, flip down push handles and the mechanisms that kind of take up a little bit of the bulk. If the only way you could raise this back was by going up higher in the back canes, we wouldn't have had that versatility. But more and more, we're seeing backs with vertical slotting that allow you to, I didn't have to move on the, with the hardware. Um, on the back cane, we could just loosen this up and slide the back in that vertical slotting. And it had been like in the lowest position and we raised it up all the way. So we ended up raising his, his back like three inches mm -hmm. for him. So mm -hmm. th actually probably a little bit more than that. So, so that's, what that, that's what that finishes like. So this is where he had kind of started. Um, and I if have you look to say, the, I have to step in for a minute. Okay. I don't like this. I'm gonna say, I use it. I always like seat. I like uh, seat stabilizers yeah. or solid seat yeah, inserts. Yeah, a lot of sling. He, and I, I hide it in the second layer of. Um, <laughs> I hide it underneath that. Um, uh, that that. Um, the waterproof the cover. The waterproof the cover? cover. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The waterproof cover. Yeah. But I think he took his out, so I'm going to ask him. But normally he's pretty hammock there. Yeah. So I'm not yeah, in love with that picture. Yeah. That bottom one. But yeah. But I mean, that's shoulder. just where where the where we had been mounted in relation to the back ends and how we were able to bring the back up. And I'm standing up a little bit different. So um, so one of the other things that really I have to say it was really impressive, and you and you actually even saw this if you were here for um, for the the bet ladies. Yeah. presentation prior the girls the vet girls who were here earlier um, is uh, and even at your old place you guys um, there are several facilities that I've gotten to visit around the United States that have great uh, wheelchair skill areas and this is on the cord side I think on no your, no well no this was this? in a, a satellite uh, was, building okay. was in a satellite building and what I did after years of going to the wheelchair games is I would come back after each year and I'd have my wheelchair tech make me a piece. So over the years, we got, we got pieces. So I'd like come back and like, can you make me a letter? Can you make me this? He's like, quit going, quit going to that game. So anyway, there's um, gravel, 
This is a gravel pit. That's a grass pit. That's a, that's a mattress. Um, this is a curb cut, and this is six inches. Um, so I started out with blocks when I teach wheelchair. We have a 12 week wheelchair skills program. I can extend it, I can shorten it. Um, this is the benefit of being at the VA and I do really understand that. I'm grateful for that because um, I get to do the, I get to have the time to do this. But I have a one inch block, a, a two inch block, and then a four inch and a six inch. And we also had a set of four stairs. So we would go so far as to teach them how to go downstairs, like one step, two step, then four, then four stairs, if they had that capability and they had that desire. So four steps is a controlled fall. So you have two, you have two spotters, but it was amazing. Your world is this big without a wheelie. It's this big with a wheelie. And so that's the real goal is to get people to explain that, you know, you give them a chair like I don't need to know how to do this. I, don't, I have a caregiver. I'm like, ah, oh, you don't need your caregiver. You can do this yourself. And I also get it like a lot of facilities don't have the room and space to do something like this. But I've been to facilities that have this type of stuff in a training area outside in their building, outside their building or in a courtyard. But I've also I mean, you know, where where I used to work, where my friend Diane here works. Um, you know, in, in downtown Detroit, like there's curb cuts and there's horribly high four plus inch curbs and there's grassy knolls and there's all kinds of crap to, uh, and, and gravel and all kinds of places to go. Um, to, you know, so if all you're doing is challenging a consumer by having them, you're setting up a chair very um, vanilla and then you're without a lot of rear seat to floor height uh, slope. And then all you do is push on the linoleum in the hospital. You got, there is that there's nothing easier than that right it's not about wheelchair that's not wheelchair skills it's when you got to go up and down and 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 because that's what real life outside your building is like so um so this is your oh yeah your, this um, so i love this yeah we we've been fortunate we um we get a group in uh, pt students from uh, tokyo from a PT school in Tokyo, and they have a sister university in Denver. So they they come over for two weeks uh, as part of their program, and then uh, I think they're at Craig actually for a day, and they're with us. They're all they also come to visit us for hours, and we run them through the um, low vision program, the amputee program, um, the AT program, and the wheelchair program. So I coordinate all that, and at the end we do some wheelchair skills. So it's really fun for these Japanese students because um, um, Japanese students are pretty reserved so um, our prosthetist years ago he's retired was a Japanese Hawaiian and he was an amputee and so he always put credible lay, um, cloth on his socket so he always had wild sockets so the students come in and they see the lab where they make them and all of a sudden he pulls up their leg, his leg and they're like oh and then all these young you know Japanese are very shy and and so when they get to the skills part they're also very shy but then they just really blossom so it's been a really really great collaboration and so this would be the type of stuff that when she was talking about wheelchair skills like they get this little version I didn't we, we, we didn't have time to have any of her consumers come in and like do all this but but they have the mechanism to come in and, and work on all these advanced wheelchair skills over time so you know your, your actual your actual vets that you're working with mm -hmm. so I just want I just thought they were just fun pictures to include I didn't want to like that's not our case studies, but I want to do that. So, and then this is, we were trying to go from a least to more complicated complex, com complex, um, in, in, in this presentation. So, I, um, so this is a little bit different. This is a gentleman, I think 40 years, right? Status post mm -hmm. onset. 40 years, T8, um, LT para. Then he became a hemipelvectomy and that was very tricky. Um, and so once we got him in a custom ride designs, cushion him back, um, it really, really supported him nicely. This is a fellow that um, hasn't missed a beat. I mean, skis, hand cycles, married. Um, so his chair is, super, it's his legs, right? It's super important. So we brought him in just to mess around knowing, I didn't want to really want to, I was a little nervous about tweaking with him because I don't want to mess up his world. But I said, can we just go up and can we go down a little bit and then see how you feel? So anyway, we, and his TR, his actually frame was bent when he came in. So uh, we're gonna have to revisit his frame, his chair. But anyway, the next slide is we ended up, uh, lowering down a half an inch and then raising up a half an inch and he was the one patient or the one client we had that liked it better an inch higher a half an inch a half an inch higher so this is so this is how the chair was set up when he came in so those are our side views um, so if you can kind of see where his hand so that's a great setup if you look where his hand is in the center picture here 
in relation to the axle hub. Um, so, you know, and, and I would expect that, right? 40 years using wheeled mobility, this should be pretty dialed in for him at this point. And with, you know, with all of the orthopedic changes in the hemipelvectomy, like he really needs very specific seating. So that's all dialed in really, really nice. So we lowered the rear seat to floor height from the, a half inch from the starting position. Um, so we tilted him in space a little bit. Um, and he really hated it. <laughs> he did not like it at all, which was, he was great. He, he's the princess in the pea, so we were really happy to have him come in. Yep, and, and so you can see, so he is, now I've got his fingers are below the axle hub. That, that half inch made a, a real difference. Um, and um, then we raised his seat to floor height, so we went a half inch down, and then not just back where he started, but a half inch up, mm -hmm. right? So if I'm tilting somebody in space when I lower, I'm actually kind of, I'm changing his orientation a little bit more forward. And then he said that he felt a lot less crunched and, and compressed in this. So, um, so even though it's not what you would think, right? He's not, I, I kind of, we kind of took him up just a, you know, a, just a, smidge. a smidge, smidge in relation to the axle of the wheel, but he really felt like it was easier for him to sit up. And then I've got some videos that we're going to show you of him. So, um, uh, the uh, with him because his, he did have a complaint, not the bent frame. Yeah. No, <laughs> it was getting in and out of his van ramp that was really a bear for him. This is a huge deal for him, right? So he so he came to clinic alone, right? So this is so this is him. This is him going up the ramp. You're not helping, right? No, I, I gave, gave you a little, little finger. <laughs> That sounds terrible. There you go. It wasn't me, though, finger. right? That's all. It. Everybody in the world is waiting for me to say something incredibly inappropriate during a presentation. So it's like, for him. so, so he's just like, it's like, it, it's a struggle for him to do to that. And that was that not right. just because of the angle. Like that was something that was it was like bef that was what he led with. He started with it's yeah, really getting hard. I'm right? so glad you suggested this. I am, this I am not a VA employee. No, you're not. But I am. <laughs> nice little wheelie yeah, this control. Is like my number one. Issue. Trouble. Okay, yeah. let's go back and tweak it again. Yep, let's there we go. Here. Okay. That's why I brought you in. Yep. So, so again, I love this. I, I worked with so many consumers when I was a therapist. If they had had that van, they would never have bothered with the wheelie. They would have just gone Baja straight down that ramp and run into the van next to them and de broken their platellas, right? That's, you know what I mean? I'm like, wheelchair skills, big, big time important. <laughs> so, um, so maybe not what we would have expected with him, but he also has like a little bit more of a belly. Yeah, he's got some abdominal tissue. Yep, that and he's it's, working and with. it's a little dis. You saw it was a little bit displaced, which is common when you're if you've not worked with anybody with a hemipelvectomy. Um, so anyway, um, so there's so that's all three set up side by side. So this is his initial setup in the chair, and. It just like when I was looking at these over like the last couple of weeks, like it really like the slope of his back and how he was at rest, I thought was pretty interesting. Yeah, this is only one inch, but it just looks really drastic, actually. Yeah, it's pretty dramatic. Right. And for him, it is because of what he's doing. Yeah. So it's a half inch variance, but it's mm -hmm. like we went from right. 16 and a half down to 16 and then and then you pop back up right. that inch to 17. And it's like, but just in a resting, more neutral orientation, I thought was pretty interesting. And again, not what I would have expected. So anyway, so the takeaways on this, right? Um, so wheelchair, so that my, the, I, oh, I told Patrice, I, so my takeaways after spending two days with her at clinic and then two days going through all the pictures and kind of getting ourselves organized and figuring out how we were going to do this. So it impressed me a lot about how many of the veterans, consumers that you're working with, um, even because we saw 10 people, um, a lot of them have a better, uh, uh, a, a fairly good understanding about the adjustment on their chair. Um, several of them are like, you know, oh, I played around, I tweaked. With, so they're like working at it, which is why you need to keep a record of where, how you ordered something to start, right? Notes. But they're playing around with everything. Five minutes. And then, um, and then the amount, the wheelchair skills level. So it was like it was it it was um, it's not the norm, and I totally get that. Um, but it's like you know I think that there's a real justification and a need to be able to do that. 
and you know the luxury of the time is is probably the the greatest thing that is is hurting um, you know service delivery and everything that we do and then the other thing would have been that still and for as long as you've been doing this like I still see so many people ordering back lengths overly long um, and mounted so that they close off the space between the top of the cushion and the buttock so if you don't if you've got a flat you get somebody with a flat bum. Like, I totally get that, but I don't have that. I've got a little bit of booty tissue. Even the chairs that y'all are sitting in in here has got a gap between the seat and the lower part of the back support for some of that posterior pelvic soft tissue to, to tuck into, right? So anyway, and, and I have two takeaways. One isn't written up here. My first takeaway was actually giving yourself some grace to if you don't have time, because I know the private sector is a lot more challenging. Um, even if you make one, one adjustment, it's an adjustment. In the uh, Jewish culture, I have a friend of mine says, if you've helped one person, you've helped the world. So if you've made one adjustment, you've helped one person, you've helped the world. The second one I didn't write in here, but the second one is if she horn swoggles you and comes out for four days and you spend 10 hours for two days and 10 hours or 12 hours at your house, you might get a new microwave. My microwave breaks in the middle of this. We stop what we're doing and we put a new microwave in my house. We had to YouTube it. I was like, go Stephanie. So two mechanical girls, don't underestimate us. Yes. Yeah, and kitchen appliances. That's right. There you go. So, Chairs and, and appliances. Right. Yeah, and so, and so just if, you're, if you do this already, if you don't do this, if you're gonna, if you're, if I've motivated, if we've motivated any of you to try this, <laughs> Um, even if you have a clinic, don't have all of your chairs set up all exactly the same. same. Have a chair that's got a little bit more, you know, half, a, half an inch and a half, half a two, go crazy. Have a chair that's two and a half and go wild, right? Um, so um, make sure you have to, if you're doing this, you have to true up your casters. Um, I, I, I don't know if there's anybody. You're going to run out of time. You have to adjust your anti-tippers. might have to pack them back up a little bit so they're not just rolling on them. And sometimes you do have to adjust your wheel box because lowering your rear seat floor can sometimes throw that off. Um, and then make sure you're checking and adjusting your back okay. frame angles. There are even a couple of cross brace folding frame chairs that have adjustable angle back uh, canes. Um, and then armrests. So most of your consumers are not using armrests, but um, especially like swing away half arms, Sometimes as you the lower the rear seat to floor height, um, you can end up with the attachment mechanism can kind of get wheel. bring your arm rest so that they're dragging on your wheels. So that would be bad. I don't want to do that. So, all right. And uh, oops, I just made it, hit the wrong button. So, and like I said, so a bunch of references. Everybody's like, click, 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 click. But I'd be happy to, we'll be happy to send these out and post these up for you. All right. And that's it. And thank you. Contact information. <laughs> so question there.